60% of American adults now have at least one chronic disease. 60% have at least one. 40% have two or more. Sean Stevenson is an, a best-selling author. We're gonna talk about not just what to eat, but the environment you eat in right. and the people you're eating with. The families that eat together on a consistent basis tended to eat significantly less ultra processed foods and significantly more whole real foods, namely fruits and vegetables. And as a result, significantly higher rates of essential nutrients that help to prevent diseases in those family members. And I was just like, that is nuts. Welcome back to the Quick Brain Podcast. We are dedicated to building better brains. Our goal is one billion brighter brains. No brain left behind. The topic of today, we're gonna to talk about social connections, nutritious foods for brain optimization and for greater performance. And I can't think of a better guest to have than the guest that we've had more than any other time on this show. Sean Stevenson. Many of you know, uh, if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, I encourage you to subscribe. We have over uh, 1.2 million subscribers there. If you're watching this on video, we happen to be at uh, at his set right now, uh, the Model Health Show, which is the number one health podcast, uh, one of our favorites on the team for sure. He is a best-selling author. We've had him on the show talking about sleeping smarter, eating smarter, and he's just one of one of the, the best guys out. And he's guy's got the most amazing voice ever. Welcome, welcome to the show, Sean. Thank you. I've got to live up to the hype now, man. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for being back on the show. Of so course. you we've had you on more than any other person. And um very, very, very proud. You have a new book coming out called Eat Smarter, which is a family cookbook. Yeah. And it's so much more than just a cookbook. Yes, there's great ideas on meal prep and foods that are great for your own performance, your mental health, your brain health, you know, your personal uh, performance. But we're going to talk about not just what to eat, but the environment you eat in right. and the people you're eating with. Yeah. So what, what was the impetus for this new book? Yeah, this is obviously a very unique cookbook. It has over 250 scientific references in a cookbook, which has never yes. been done before. Uh, but all in a way, and you know this, in a way that's entertaining, that's inviting, empowering, yeah. uh, laid out in a very beautiful way as well. This is gonna be a staple really in people's kitchens. We're already seeing it happen, which is just mind blowing. And the the really, the driving force behind writing this book was, you know, for many years working as a clinician and being a research scientist and, you know, doing all this work and teaching and speaking and all this stuff, it was really interesting because a lot of times we mean well when we're advocating for people to make behavior changes. Yeah. Right? You know, we can tell them do this thing to get this result. And we give them that behavior change and then they go into an environment that might that might be counter that behavior change or that might even belittle that behavior change or overall just make that behavior change much more difficult to do in the first place. And what that environment is, is the culture. Hmm. The culture that we exist in is what's impacting our choices more than anything else. But our culture is sort of like an invisible hand. We don't really understand or realize what's guiding us. And we make choices based on what we're exposed to. We're, we make choices, even, even cravings are cultural. We're not going to crave in Cambodia. They're eating some, you know, a delicacy is deep fried tarantulas, right? Wow. It's people that eat tarantulas out there, you know, and, and, you know, Iceland fermented shark is a thing, you know, here in the United States, we're going to crave different things, namely ultra processed foods, as you know, is the dominant part of our diet. And this is according to the BMJ. Again, we talk about that in the book. And so instead of treating the symptom, which is unfortunately what we're doing in modern medicine, you know, we have this model for symptom focus instead of removing the root cause. Mm. Instead of doing that with behavior change target, which is targeting a symptom, I'm working now and giving people the, the data and the empowerment to be able to change the culture so that the behavior becomes automatic, right? So that there's no longer a struggle to do the thing that you deem to be the right thing for you. And with that being said, you already brought this up, how we eat who we're eating with has a huge impact on our food choices and our health outcomes. I'll share a couple of st studies with you. I'll just rattle them off really quickly. This blew my mind. So one of them was a bunch of researchers at Harvard were collecting data on family eating behaviors, like how frequently they're eating together and their food choices. And this was going on for years. And I was just like, how do people not know this? Like this should be on billboards. And what they found was that families that eat together on a consistent basis 
tended to eat significantly less ultra processed foods, namely chips and soda, and significantly more whole real foods, namely fruits and vegetables. And as a result, significantly higher rates of essential nutrients that help to prevent diseases in those family members. Wow. And I was just like, that is nuts. Does this apply in other contexts? Like, can we get some specific things that get reduced as far as disease outcomes? And I found two studies. Well, I found a bunch more, but I'll share it with you too. One of them was published in Pediatrics. So we're looking at outcomes for kids. And another one was published in JAMA. This is the journal of the American Medical Association. This is one of our top tier journals here in the United States. And these researchers found that, and I'm also gonna share a minimal effective dose, yes. which I'm a big fan of that. Mm -hmm. They found that eating together with your family three times a week, three times a week led to a plummeting rate of obesity outcomes in those children and significantly lower disordered eating in those children as well when they ate with their parents three times a week. And now also, of course, I want to give a minimum effective dose because we've got a lot of stuff going on. Right, right. And we want to find the leverage point, right? Where do we actually see that tipping point to where we get these benefits? But another barrier to entry, which I'm uniquely qualified for, is is this going to apply if we don't have resources, if we don't have access? Because a lot of that, even saying eating with the parents, is that applicable? What if you only have one parent in the household and what mm -hmm. if they're working and all these things? And so for myself, I grew up in the inner city and in poverty. And in the United States, I always say this with a caveat, poverty is very different here in the United States versus other places. Sure. Um, you know, in the United States, if you're living in poverty, we still probably have a TV. We still have, like, we would get the video game system like a year later, but we still get one. Right. Um, my mom would get, and this is a true story, she'd get cars from a place called OK Junk Cars. And so she kept buying these Ford Escorts and one breaks down, she gets the next one. And it's actually how I learned how to drive a stick shift, by the way. Um, but we were st we were getting by, we were getting by, and it wasn't so much about resources, but resourcefulness, mm -hmm. of course. And most importantly, and here's what the data indicated, like does this apply when it doesn't fit into this kind of white picket fence narrative? And so another study was looking at minority children who generally live in a low income context. And by the way, we were getting food from charities. You know, there's a place called the Hosea House where government assist assistance. My mom was trying to find a way to provide for us. She would sell her blood sometimes mm -hmm. to get money. She worked overnight at a convenience store. And one of those nights she was actually attacked. She was stabbed eight times, uh, fending off somebody who's trying to rob the store. And my mom is different though. And my son is here in the studio with me. She He knows she's different. She actually um, not just survived that, but she actually was able to subdue the guy until the police came. Yeah, it's crazy. Wow. But when she went in to get you know stitched up and go through the procedures, the physician afterwards told her that if you weren't overweight, if you weren't a heavy set woman, as he put it, you would have died. Basically her, her being overweight and she was right there teetering on obesity at the time, saved her. And so what do you think she's gonna attach to that? Yeah. Right. So now that's her protection. And so I'm setting all this up to say, this is the environment that I come from. I come from this very volatile environment, but had my family known what I'm about to share with you, we would have put it into place because my mother wanted to do well for us. She just didn't know. So as you said many times, knowledge is not power. Knowledge applied is power. But that knowledge, that awareness is kind of that first domino is what you're going to do with it. And so what these researchers found was that for these children in, in this low income environment, if they ate with their family members, whatever meal, breakfast, lunch, dinner, didn't matter, four times a week, those children ended up eating significantly less ultra processed foods, namely chips and soda they identified significantly less. And, and they ended up eating five servings of fruits and vegetables daily, five days of the week, all right? There was something special about eating together with the family that led to these outcomes. And by the way, the researchers noticed specifically when the TV was never or rarely on during meal times. And uh, before I pass it back to you, this is not an advocation for we. My family and I, my son is here. We love a good movie night, or yeah. you know, grabbing some snacks and watching the game, something like that. But we also need that FaceTime in the real world to actually see each other and to connect, because the dinner table, in many ways, is a unifier, and. I'll just share really quickly and then pass it back to you. 
we can talk a little bit about what's happening behind the scenes. Like why is it leading to these different outcomes? And one of those reasons is when you're around people that you care about, we start to make different chemistry. And as you know, we've talked about this before, your thoughts create chemistry in your body instantaneously. The most powerful pharmacy in the universe is in your own body. And I say that because it's not just bioidentical. It is made for you. It is tailor-made with the chemistry you're creating is made for your receptor sites and it's based on your perception. And when we're around people that we care about, we start producing, one of the compounds we start to produce is oxytocin. And oxytocin has been found to basically counteract cortisol. And so we're switching over from this fight or flight sympathetic dominance that we're all just kind of habitually in today, the average person. We, we can go to zero to 100 really quick, but we're not very good at going from 100 to zero and down regulating unless we get around people that we love. Hmm. And so we're switching over to the parasympathetic rest and digest is the nickname nervous system when we're around people that we care about under the umbrella of good food. So let's let's unpack that. This is amazing. And I, and I wanna commend you on having the focus on behavioral change because that's a big part of our listenership. They want to, they realize again, that knowledge is only potential power, only comes power when we change a behavior. Right, and um, and so you're saying it's not just our neurological networks or our biological networks. A big part of our performance and our health comes from our social networks, yeah. right? And so when you're in that parasympathetic rest and digest, it's not just what you eat, it's, it's how you're eating, the state you're eating in, and also the environment. Yeah, and so that specifically, let's give this a label so we can talk about this. We have a larger culture scape or a macro culture and here in the United States, and this is according to the CDC, their last published statistics, 60% of American adults now have at least one chronic disease. 60% have at least one. 40% have two or more. We now have a culture, a larger culture scape, where if you're healthy, you're not normal. You're no longer in the average. You're no longer in the majority. And so you see where I'm going at here. That's the larger culture scape. And we, we do exist in that. It's kind of like in a glorified snow globe here on planet Earth in many ways. But what we can do is create microcultures within our own household, namely, and in particular, but I, this is a caveat, the microculture starts with you. You are a reflection of your culture. The culture is coming from within. And I realized this recently, you know, after completing this book, I start to see more real world, you know, what you're attuned to, you'll start to see it. And we went to Hawaii recently for the first time. And again, coming from where I come from to even go to Hawaii in the first place is like mind blowing. And I saw, and my son being here, he saw this multiple times as well. Like people would come over to us and talk to us, you know, even on the plane, we're just sitting on the plane. People would walk by and just like, I love your family. We take our culture with us hmm. everywhere that we go. You can plant me into this new culture, but I'm a reflection of my culture. And there's an energy behind that as well. And that energy, and I'm, you know, I'm a big fan of the work from Heart Math Institute. And um, you know, for many years, like I actually, even when I didn't have much money living in like Ferguson, Missouri, I would like kind of tithe where I was getting my, my, my education from, right? My spiritual food. And so I would tithe to like the Institute of Noetic Sciences, Heart Math Institute. And we now have we now have innovations where we can see some of the energy that we can't see with our particular range of vision, which we know that some animals see very differently than we see, for example, but there's a lot of things that we can't see. And as you know, everything is energy, but there's a field, there's an electromagnetic field that radiates really from the human heart several feet, up to eight feet, and they call this a tube torus. And so truly when you're in the space with another person, our energy fields are interacting, sure. right? So when we're talking about vibes or we're talking about how our brains sync up and this is from researchers at yale just sitting in a room with a person that we don't even know and having a little bit of rapport for maybe like 10 minutes our brain waves start to sync up and and mirror each other right and it's just like we are social social creatures we're evolved to do that we see it in other species like we see like how those birds know how to do that v like who's the leader like how do bees know like no we can do that too but a lot of times we're so distracted from the fact that that's happening. And so saying all this to say that by intentionally creating a microculture where you have healthier social interactions, where we understand the power of proximity and even microbial, there's a microbial data change. 
exchange whenever you're in proximity with another person. It's kind of like music file sharing back in the day. You know, this catalog is getting more expansive, right? And so we have that, we have something that we can't see. We could, the microbial cascade is a little bit more tangible for us, I think, as the average person thinks. But at the end of the day, when we create this microculture and I have my son right here in the room with us, and can you just shout out, what do we do today together outside? We work out as a family. That's right, that's right. He's, you know, he's, he's, he just turned 12, so he's got the yeah, voice yeah, now, yeah, you yeah, know? Yeah. He's gotta be, but we worked out together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just a part of our culture. And, you know, so much of what we do, what we've done, we've created a physical culture in our household. And also finding joy in it, you know, finding an opportunity to make sure we're doing things that he loves to do. Even when we're driving over here, I asked him like, well, so what did you enjoy most about the workout? You know, just like taking those mental notes so I can add to it for, for the culture. And also, you know, knowing, and this is some just some tips for parents in general. A lot of times when we're wanting to change the microculture, it's, it's hard because we all, children, we're just big adult babies. But a lot of times we resist change because we're comfortable. Even if we don't like where we are, we're comfortable with it. And there's something kind of soothing for the mind to have automation. Hi, this is Jim Quick, author of the New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestseller, Limitless. And today I am thrilled to share with you some exciting news. It is Limitless Expanded. It's an updated and brand new edition of my transformative guide, and now it's enriched with new insights and new tools to help you navigate our post-pandemic world. For a limited time, when you pre-order your copy of Limitless Expanded, you're gonna get exclusive free access to my 13-day Quick Start 2.0 training. It's a brain training, plus a bunch of amazing bonuses. Just go to limitlessbook.com and pick up a copy for you and pick up a copy for a friend. And so one of the most practical things we can do, and this should be obvious, but it's to pay attention. Just pay attention to your child or to your significant other because you know what motivates them. You know what pisses them off. You know what excites them, what de-excites them. You know what evokes um, you know, creativity and the list goes on and on. We know those conditions, but a lot of times we make ourselves suffer because and I heard this from my mother, you know, many times, a lot of times she just kind of forfeited relationships, you know, with, with her, with her kids. She was just, she would say this. She said, Sean, I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired. And because we're tired, we don't want to, or don't have the mental energy to be patient, to be observant. And so that microculture starts with us starting to fill up our own cup and starting to it's not even add energy, but to activate, to remove blockages mm -hmm. so that we have access to more energy for us to pay attention, for us to use as a benevolent leader, those psychological leverage points so that we can create a more cohesive unit. And last point I'll share. So it's like, I know that my son loves basketball, you know? And so being able to tie things into that, what he loves, you know, I can't just make this about me. And I didn't have that, I didn't feel as seen as a child. And so it was really like, you do what I say or else kind right. of thing. And it's it's still out of love. It's still out of an intention for you know me to be a well-adapted human, but my mom is gonna do the best that she knows how to do at the time. And so for me, I'm practicing presence and being able to see what he's interested in and tie our culture into that for his own good and for our cohesiveness as a family, that it is harder, but we get to choose our heart because the outcomes of him rebelling or you know, having behaviors that end up hurting him or hurting other people, that's gonna be hard as well. So it's like, we get to choose our heart and start to stack conditions. you know. And so really the advocation with this new project is for us to feel empowered, to take, uh, to control the controllables in creating our own microculture to make healthy behaviors more automatic. And and this is a crazy word, F word, but make it fun as well. And finding the fun in it, finding the joy, and also challenging ourselves too. And we could even find fun in that. And you're, you know, I see you interacting with your family. You could be the same parent, but also 
be a different parent for each child based on their purpose, based on their interests. You know, when you're tailoring these conversations around, you know, their personal passions, you know, there's a depth of it. I love how you anchor everything into science. Like with this book, you know, you're pulling into not only nutritional science, obviously, but also the social sciences. You know, we've talked about how we become uh, the people we're around with our mirror neurons and how you, you know, the, the tr neurotransmitters that are being, especially oxytocin, the parasympathetic rest and, and digest. So all, all these things, and when you mentioned hard math, you know, it, who you eat with affects your blood pressure, affects your heart rate variability, all these different things. So when people are listening now, what are, we always talk about these small, simple steps, because I love how you anchor everything into behavioral change. That's a very cheetah thing to do for people who are familiar with our brain animal types, right? And uh, also you have a very strong owl, you know, in terms of logic, and you want to know, you know, all the different studies that back this up and your recommendations, you can get results because, because of that and you make it very interesting. So what would be a, if we're going for behavioral change, what are some suggestions or starting points for someone listening that they could take to make this a little bit more effortless and, and enjoyable? Great question. I'm going to preface this with one more little nugget for parents, for adults, because I shared a lot on children's health mm -hmm. outcomes. There's another study that I cited in the book looking at office workers at IBM. And, okay. you know, working in tech can be stressful, but they found that worker morale, productivity, stress, all stayed in healthy ranges when they were able to make it home for dinner. Mm. But as soon as work obligations and other things start to cut into their ability to have dinner with their families, work morale plummeted, productivity went down, and their stress levels began to elevate significantly. And that matters because, and this was published in JAMA as well, 60 to upwards of 80% of all physician visits today are for stress-related illnesses. Stress is like a seed of so many of the health outcomes that we're seeing today. And so how do we get these advantages? How do we get this kind of protective force field around our families and transition? Maybe right now that's not a part of your culture. Maybe you don't have those three days, those that minimum effective dose. And the first step here is one of the things that you talk about, schedule it, schedule it. When, you, when we had a conversation earlier, and you mentioned scheduling. I was just like, that is so practical and Captain Obvious, but we don't do it. And so, so many other obligations that are less important than our family go on our calendar. Yeah. And so this is a call to arms because a lot of times if we don't schedule it today, it's not real. So pick those three days, whatever they are. It could be different meals. It could be Monday family dinner, Wednesday family dinner, brunch on Sundays, right? Figure out based on your schedule, your unique lifestyles, could be breakfast, you know, whatever days a week, whatever it looks like for you and your family right now. And by the way, you don't even have to stress yourself out trying to get three. If you're going from zero to three, that's quite a task, even just having one or two, right? But three, according to the data, is that minimum effective dose. So that's number one, schedule it. Pick those days, literally put it on your schedule so that it gets some tangibility right out, right out of the gate. Another uh, strategy here for this kind of transition is we have to really understand something about us as humans today. We're addicted to our devices, all right? And so being the, fa the fact that we have this addiction, and we're in a safe space, so we could say it, all right? We are, I'm Sean Stevenson, and I have a problem. You know, we can be <laughs> honest about it, that our tech is so integrated into our lives, our yeah. devices can divide us, and it is what it is. And so again, I said this earlier, this isn't an advocation for you to not have a family movie night or to watch a show or whatever while you eat. This is to make sure we're getting real FaceTime with the people that we love. And I'll share why in just a moment, but how do we go from like, my kid is gaming with his friend, I'm like, we're having family dinner. Get off your device, you right. know, like you're coming in with the brute force. You could force somebody to do something, but that rebellion like is innate in humans. Like we wanna be free. And so my son, I know their characters as well. My older son is much more easy breezy. So we could just tell him last minute, like, oh, family dinner, or whatever. My youngest son, he wants to know that it's coming. If he has it, like he has it already mentally checked off, then he's cool with it, you know? But even today, our workout, because he was out of school, I was like, B, we're headed outside, you know, at such and such time. I tried to give him some advance notice, hmm. right? But I could see, the resistance there because it wasn't already on his schedule planned. 
right? So paying attention to our, our kids' personalities and the same thing with our significant others, right? So with that being said, how do we transition that? I look for ways to, if, if we have any kind of addiction and just strip it away, we're gonna have withdrawal hmm. and it can get ugly. So a much more advantageous, advantageous thing to do is, because that addiction, by the way, oftentimes get filled, filled with something else whether we're conscious of it or not. So replace it with something of equal or greater value intentionally, all right? And so I wanna make sure that his dopamine that's getting uh, that's getting dabbled with by gaming, that we bring in some kind of a, a, re a reward for our dinners as well, right? And so with that being said, this could be after dinner, we play a, f a game that he likes, right? And this could be literally, we game after. Mm -hmm. Right, we can we can play a video game together, or this could be a family like classic board game. Right, right. This could be a lot of times we end up for whatever reason our family has rap battles, or you know we we'll free freestyle together, or you never know like some kind of a some kind of a creative thing mm -hmm. tends to happen at our at our dinners, right? And so that's our unique kind of family um, modus operandi, right? So find out what that is for your family. Give yourself permission and grace to experiment. Find out what are those reward things that the family knows, like so even subconsciously, to look forward to after dinner or within the context of that dinner. Uh, last one I'll share, and there's many others, is a lead-in to that, which is having some kind of a, a practice, a unifying thing at the beginning of the meal. For us, it's gratitude. Um, mm. We've done different things over the years, but we generally go around and share three things that we're grateful for from that day. And there's a couple of reasons why, of course, you, you focus on what you filter for. And so our days are now more filled with looking for things because we're gonna have this conversation later that we're gonna be grateful for and to be able to articulate those. That's part of it. The other part is when we're sharing, we're opening up innately, right? So we're getting conversation going because we might all be in our respective places. And this could be simple things, by the way, like I'm grateful for this food. Mm -hmm. or I'm grateful for my family, or I'm grateful for turning my homework in today, or whatever it is, or it can be big things. And so sometimes you're gonna celebrate bigger things, sometimes it's small things, and you can also see the temperature of where your family member's at when they're sharing, right? Maybe there's, it's a, it's a tough day. Maybe they really gotta dig deep to find something to be grateful for. And we can be able to catch things, right, before it turns into something later on down the line. So get that real face time and most importantly, allowing your family members to feel seen. You right. know this, we have a deep need to feel significance, right? So they feel seen, we feel heard, and being able to, one of the things that's come from this, and my youngest son, man, I love you so much. He's been, he doesn't know this, but like the last couple of days, like I've done, I don't know, maybe 40 interviews in the last, you know, whatever weeks, and um, you know, it was a lot. It was a lot. And he he felt that energy right. in the house. And he would come over, he'd give me extra hugs and just like, Dad, hey, I want to make sure that you're, you know, really, you know, kind of take it easy today or whatever. Like the the reason that he's able to do that is because I opened up in a way that I, I didn't get exposed to as a man, especially growing up where I grew up at, where even showing emotion sometimes, like you could get killed, you know, like you really have to you know, put up this this energy, this facade in a sense of protection. And so when we're sharing what we're grateful for, I'm opening up uh, a sensitivity, right? Or sometimes we go around and share something we failed at that day, right? And so he gets to hear, oh, my dad failed at something? Hmm. Superman? Had a hard time? Like that was painful for you? So it humanizes me, you know, instead of our parents kind of being these these figures, right, these kind of action figures, you know, it really helps to humanize us so that we all can become more compassionate and empathetic for each other as a family unit. So there's several strategies in this. Again, finding some lead in things culturally. People have been, you know, saying prayers together, for example, for thousands of years. There's something unifying about that moment and being able to, to stop, to be present to make that switch over the dial is starting to change into that parasympathetic when you're doing this again, especially with the people that you love the most. You know, growing up, you know, uh, 
you know, child of immigrants. We, my parents had uh, many jobs, but you know what they would always prioritize would be those our dinners. You know, I didn't get to see my my parents a whole lot just because they were working so much. But it was always that time, and uh, and we always had this ritual of going around. You know, and I, I love what you say about prayer or blessing and gratitude exercise because it puts you in that kind of parasympathetic rest and digest. You know, sometimes you know we didn't spend a lot of time as a child. Me, you know, later on it got a little bit easier. You know, as they were able to kind of elevate, but um, but it was sacred. So it wasn't the amount of time they were spending with us, but it was the quality of time. You know, they were very present, and I thought that was very important. You know, so we had an interview with Simon Sinek. Um, who wrote Star With Why, and he was saying just having your device, even if it's face down or in your, who's off, created anxiety just at the dinner table or at meals when you're out at a restaurant because you have this, it's a trigger to you feeling like you have to pick it up because we're so conditioned we get to get that dopamine. You know, and so it's nice to have a little bit of a detox, you know, if, if, if possible to be, able to, to be able to do that. I shared that study in the yeah. book as well. And just again, having it in eyesight pulls away our attention mm -hmm. because our brain knows there's all kinds of goodies in that mm -hmm. device, right? So this is something years ago, we stopped bringing our devices to the table. You know, for my older son, you know, he like, literally he keeps it in his bedroom downstairs. And he's been doing that for, again, for years because again, our devices divide us. And, you know, that aspect of it, and even if it's on your person, is mm -hmm. what the, in, the the research indicated. So being in the pocket, yeah. right? So the researchers like had on the table or like in, in somebody's pocket or like in another room. Being in another room really helped for them to be more focused and present and attentive. Mm -hmm. But just again, it being on your person or being close to you, like you know the association. And so, but again, we're not villainizing the fact that, you know, our phones are awesome. You know, us being able to do this yeah. wouldn't be possible. And we've got to be able to compartmentalize because we've been missing out on something deeply embedded in what our genes expect from us to protect our health, our physical health and our mental health. We need each other. And you know, last study I'll share on this note, this was a huge meta-analysis that I detailed in the book. This was from research at Brigham Young University. A meta-analysis is multiple studies. This wasn't just 10 studies or five. This was 148 studies looking at relationships and human health and this was about 300,000 study participants by the way so it's a huge data set they found that having healthy social ties led to a 50 percent reduction in all-cause mortality all right so said it in other words having healthy relationships led to a 50 percent reduction from dying from everything everything prematurely right they said it was more powerful than uh than exercise than beating obesity, than smoking. Our relationships are that cultural shift. Why? Last thing here, most important takeaway today, our relationships determine so many of those other things. There's nothing more impactful on our food choices than our relationships. There's nothing more impactful on our mental health than our relationships. There's nothing more impactful on our success, our exercise habits. If our relationships are tattered and we're struggling in those, automatically affects all that other stuff. So this is really the tip of the spear when we're talking about cultural change. If we can focus on creating healthy, supportive relationships, it makes those behavior change, those positive things more automatic. I love that. You know, um, and we'll put all this, this, some of the studies and links to your books and your podcast, everything in the show notes at jimquick.com forward slash notes. Um, a few months ago, I have a new, newborn. He's, he's a uh, eight months and i started uh, a few months ago sketching out like a little family crest on a, on a sketch pad you know in terms of our values for our family but what i started putting on there and you could, you should take this idea it started putting around it questions to ask you know for the family and it's like a placemat mm. so imagine having like a like you know when you you have like a little like eating mat you know to put the plate on everything else has like our kind of family building out like started drawing a kind of a struggling illustrator but a little crest and then talking points of things you know like what are you grateful for you know so many times you ask somebody how was your day and they're like good right but things like you know what did what's something you learned today 
you know, you know, what's something you did for somebody else? And it starts these kind of deep conversations. I love that so much. I've, we've been talking about, funny enough, and my oldest son just mentioned this maybe a week ago about creating like a family crest. Yeah. And, um, you know, we swim in the same, same circles a lot of times, but to add questions into the, that is, I got to do that. That's so yeah. powerful. Love I mean, it. these thoughtful, we talked about in, you know, in, for your show, the power of questions, you know, and so questions that aren't open-ended, but, but they're really get people to, to share at, at a deeper level, you know, and connect. And as you mentioned it, to feel seen, you know, also, you know, it's, it's funny. It's not funny. Huh? It's, 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 it's sad that, you know, less of these meals or gatherings are, are happening. Uh, out there, you know, even at restaurants, sometimes we'll gamify it. And I'm sure other people do this also have done this or, you know, we're at a restaurant and everyone will take their phone out. And like, maybe it's a business in the lunch and but we'll put it and we'll stack them together and mm -hmm. like, okay, whoever touches their phone first pays for the meal or something Ooh. like that. But it's, there's <laughs> some kind that. of, kind of consequence, but it gets it, it really emphasizes like, Hey, this is our time for the next 45 minutes or an hour or whatever. This is something where we get to spend time and in really investing in those relationships. I would imagine a lot of those longevity studies, it's not just the food they're eating, it's the fact that they are how they're eating and exactly. the environment they're eating, you know, when they're eating and who they're eating with. I hope you're enjoying this episode. And if you want to go deeper with many of these authors that we have on our podcast, these experts, I want to invite you to join our quick success program. This is our monthly lives that I do, where I teach something brand new that we haven't taught before, answer your burning questions. And also we have something that people have been requesting for many years, a quick book club. This is your limitless book club where every single month we read a book together, uh, like a book provided by this author. And then we get the author to come online and join us for a one hour uh, share going deeper in these strategies, how to put them into practice. Uh, I share my five tips for how to memorize things out of these books. Many people want to read a book a month or build up to that. And this would be the program. So if you want to join, just go to quicksuccess.com and get your spot and join us live and get to meet these authors very uh, up close and personal. And uh, back to the episode. So what is the state that we're in right now, by the way? Because we evolved doing this together. You know, um, as a species, we would hunt together, gather food together, prepare food, eat yeah. together, celebrate. That's, again, it's super fresh for me coming from Hawaii recently and seeing this dramatization of something we used to do together being in the form of this luau that we're all you know, just sitting watching us. Like this is how we evolved. And this was a big time of learning as well. Storytelling, passing on really important tenets and insights that our ancestors had picked up from one generation to the next. And really that's what culture is, by the way. It's the attitudes, values, beliefs, and behaviors of a group of people passed on from one generation to the next. You know, now we have books to be able to do this, but there's something very primal about being able to connect and to hear people's voices and stories. And so we evolved doing that. 100% of people were doing it. And more recently, so the latest statistics show that only about 30% of American families eat together on a regular basis. All right, so it's it's on the endangered species list, big time right. right now. And even when we kind of removed tribe, like the tribal construct, and we start to have like communities, neighborhoods, we still had family close by. Now that's even more fractured. Yeah. And so again, your genes evolved. We're talking hundreds of thousands of years in this kind of form, very close to doing this certain thing. It's an epigenetic controller. And suddenly removing that just in the last few decades, like, mm -hmm. of course, we're going to have some ramifications from that. And we're seeing it. We're seeing the dysfunction. And so we've got to invite that back in now. So friends and family, by the way, it's not just family. Friends are included in this because we humans, we do certain things really well. We oxytocin it up when we're around people that we love, when we're around people that we care about. And so being more intentional about this, inviting people back together. If you don't know somebody who's doing it, be that person. You know, get your friends together. I've got a friend out here in LA. He's always been that guy, just like, where are we meeting for brunch, right? right. He, he's already made the reservations. He's already done the thing. He does it He does it to create the environment so that you, you pretty much can, you, all you can do is say yes, in a sense, you know? And you want to be a part of it because you feel good after, you know? So be that person in your group. 
help to create a culture where everybody's connecting. And also, this is, I, I can't say it's the most important, but it's very important. When you do this with delicious food, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it just takes things to another level because this is something else we evolved doing, you know? And there's recently, you know, because of our different health issues, there's been some kind of, people start to get more divided in what is the best diet, right? You know, some there are some camps and I, you know, I know the people who are like the face of every diet framework, they're my friends, right? And they all mean well. And I could tell you they're all right and wrong. You know, one of those camps is eat to live, don't live to eat. Eat to live, don't live to eat. Mouth pleasure? That's for, you know, that's for cavemen. Here's the thing. We have a very sophisticated flavor palette and our nose as well as we talked about that integration. Have you ever thought about why certain animals eat certain things? You know, like why does, you know, a cheetah eat that? Like why does a cheetah go and try to eat that animal? Or why does, you know, that bison go and nibble on that grass one day and then go nibble on these weeds over here another day? Like what is driving them to do that? We're driven to eat things that taste good to us, that they're attracted to. That's what drives them to do it. And the same thing with humans. We have very sophisticated a flavor palette that drives us to eat tasty things. We evolve with it. Now, of course, food scientists have manipulated our desire for tasty things. Absolutely. But that doesn't negate the fact that we enjoy food. And it's a big part of what unites us as a species. Mm -hmm. Like everything revolves around food, everything. Whether it's the first date, whether it's the celebration, you know, it's the, um, uh, you know, a new baby's coming into the world and the baby shower. Uh, after the game is over, you know, the list goes on and on. It revolves around food. It brings people together. But we've become more isolated and our food choices have become more ultra processed. Right. And so now oftentimes we're eating ultra processed food in front of a device. And if we can check these two boxes at one time, real food and real people, like we're going to have this huge impact on our genetic expression. Last part. And this is what's so special about this. I'm a huge foodie. I'm a nutritionist, all right? I'm a nutritionist. I've been working in this field for 21 years as of this month. And being that I'm somebody who loves the science around food and I love food, like that's a superpower right there. And working so many years, I've taught all these different nutrition classes and cooking classes before, you know, getting into the, you know, podcasting and writing books. I was on the ground making sure that food tasted delicious so that people would eat it and enjoy it and go home and make it themselves. And so being able to put all this together, and first of all, of course, I identified a little over 40 of the most science-backed foods for improving your sleep quality, yeah. your metabolic health, your cognitive performance. What are those top like 40 plus foods? And also because we have an emoji culture as well, like you know, we do this as well we, when we text. We can put, we can even have a conversation with just emojis. <laughs> but once you find out that these anthocyanins in cherries have been found in this peer reviewed study to shrink fat cells, I'm gonna put the muscle emoji next to cherries for metabolic health. I'm gonna put the sleep emoji next to cherries because it's one of the few natural food sources of concentrated melatonin mm -hmm. ever discovered, right? The list goes on and on. Whatever those emojis are, with that particular food, you'll you'll be able to eat for a purpose. And now we take that cherry and it's cool, you could eat some cherries as a snack, but what if we take this cherry and make an amazing meal or some kind of a food item with that cherry, with those cherries? So the frozen yogurt pops, for example, or the heart health shake, that's just like this chocolate ice cream, basically, you know, it's just so delicious that now you can go back to the recipes and see those emojis and like, oh, I wanna, make sure that I'm doing something for, you know, I'm trying to get better sleep quality and get these good sleep nutrients in my body in a delicious way. Um, last, I'll share a couple more really, really quickly. Um, By the way, there's, can... there's there's gonna be a huge spike in cherry sales. This is the, <laughs> this is the Sean Stevenson effect. <laughs> it's a real thing apparently. Um, but, you know, I can't talk with you and not mention this, but something for brain health yeah. and cognitive performance. You know, a lot of people over the years, we've talked about this, you know, we know about DHA and EPA, these omega-3s. Listen, for years in my clinical practice, when I found out about omega-3s, because I was 
educated in a conventional university, I wasn't taught a distinction be between them because there's multiple forms of vitamin C, there's multiple forms of magnesium, the list goes on and on, and the omega-3s as well. And so I would tell people to have you know flax seeds and hemp seeds and borage oil and all this stuff, get your omega-3s in. That's ALA, the plant form. And your body can convert a small amount into DHA and EPA, which your brain needs, but you can lose upwards of 80% in that conversion process, depending on your unique microbiome, your genes, the list goes on and on. So it's not efficient to me to be able to meet your needs. And we know what the needs are. And I talk about this in the book. So these researchers used fMRIs to look at people's brains and to see their intake of DHA and EPA and the impact that it had on their brains. They found that people who had less than four grams of those omega-3s had the highest rate of brain shrinkage. So the wow. brains were atrophying. Four grams was that minimum effective dose to keep the brain robust and healthy. We do not want shrinkage, all right, of any type really, but especially for your brain. And so the question is why? Why, why are omega-3 so remarkable for keeping the brain volume where it needs to be? And these, what makes them different than ALA? And ALA, ALA can pr pr primarily be used as an energy substrate, like with carbohydrates or ketones. DHA and EPA are used as structural fats. There are gates in the blood-brain barrier that shuttle DHA and EPA to the brain in vast amounts whenever it's available to help to ensure signal transduction of your brain cells, uh, you know, plasticity. Our brain cells oftentimes have to live for years, sometimes decades, and it's not like other cells. So if there is metabolic waste left over, and the glymphatic system is pressing out, you know, like we've got some old kind of shoddy windows, like there's, it was kind of boarded up on these brain cells. Now we got some omega-3s in, we can help to rebuild that cell, right? But what if you're deficient in them? You're not gonna be able to rebuild and restructure, remodel your brain as you are remodeled through life. So that's why they're so remarkable. Where do we get them? A lot of times we go right to supplementation, which is cool, but that should supplement an already dominant diet for your cognitive function. And so there's a variety, of, the most popular food out there, of course, is gonna be salmon, but there's also mackerel, uh, sardines, there's a ton of different, quote, fatty fish that are rich in DHA and EPA. But even within salmon, there's a range. There's king salmon, there's coho salmon, but one serving of king salmon, which is the most omega-3 rich, one serving, we'll just say six to eight ounces, you're gonna hit that four grams. And because it's from that salmon that has astaxanthin in it, which is that reddish pigment, it's going to protect it through cooking. All right, we don't want to deep fry the salmon, but just a gentle cooking process, usually, you know, maybe you grill it or whatever, you're going to get those omega-3s. All right, so you can meet that. We got it in egg yolks, grass-fed beef as well. But if somebody is doing a vegan or vegetarian protocol, please get yourself some krill oil, which is a microscopic Keyword, microscopic, microscopic shrimp, all right? Incredibly rich in astaxanthin. This is what the salmon are eating to get the omega-3s in their tissues. Or if you want to go full-on, full-on vegan, algae oil. Get yourself a concentrate of algae oil. We don't have the peer-reviewed data on that, though. We know that it's in there, but the robust data on, you know, and this was published in the journal Neurology, they found that eating one seafood meal per week People do, in fact, perform better on cognitive skills tests than people who aren't eating it. All right. So there's something about it. There's an affinity towards the brain. And so we take that and I'll share with my favorite meal probably right now is the salmon burgers in the East Martyr Family Cookbook. Mm. They're fire. They're just they just are. They're amazing. So it's not OK, cool. We can have a salmon filet. But what if we turn this into a experience where everybody is flipping out just like, oh, this is so good. And having that energy around the table with the people that you love that's getting logged in your brain as well like wow when i get together with these people i have these amazing pleasurable experiences that my genes evolved having so yeah you know is this work being um if it's if you don't have a family unit like uh years ago i lived between new york and la when i moved to la and i didn't have my family i moved out to los angeles for the work we do in hollywood but i would you know, I would miss them and I would host these dinners like every every week and we would have these rituals. And one of my favorite holidays is Thanksgiving, right? So I would host like a Friendsgiving 
because I, you know, I was a transplant in LA, like most people are, but I didn't have a, you know, a family. And so, you know, and we would have these conversations, people would share a personal or professional success or a challenge that we're dealing with, yeah. or we'd go through a rose bud thorn exercise. You're familiar, like rose, you sh- everyone shares a rose, you know, something that's happy mm-hmm. in, the, in the currently, or a bud is like an opportunity or a thorn is something that's challenging them, those kind of things. But does it work? Does it, do people get the same kind of benefits if they're communing and it's not family and it's friends and coworkers and great question absolutely yes yes and i've been to mm-hmm. a couple of these dinners with you one of them resulted in that book that's over on the shelf right there sleep smarter yes by having that dinner with you and that time with you and the incredible people you were bringing together magic happens man yeah you know incredible things happen when humans get together in the real world and connect as we evolve doing yes our technology can unite us in other ways but it can also divide us and so making sure that we have in the real world some real face time. And like you just said, especially if, what if you don't have your family nearby? Be that person, bring people together, you know? Get a couple of friends together. Uh, one of my friends here in LA, he, he has this men's group that he put together. N- you know, no one else was, you know, kind of getting together for the guys. So like every Sunday they get together and they go for a hike or something, or they go to brunch or, you know, like he decided to be the person because he's, he saw his friends starting to isolate and separate. You know, so yes, friends are invited. You know, do this for our little ones and our elder ones as well, mm-hmm. you know, whenever we can. But again, it's a superpower to schedule it because that's an action. Like you're taking an idea and making some tangibility out of it. That's really the first step. You know, make the decision, right? Get the awareness that this this matters in a big way and take an action by putting on the calendar. Mm. I have to recommend this book. This is Eat Smarter Family Cookbook. It's not only nutritious, but it's d- delicious. And the photos in there, we were talking about it, absolutely amazing. And it's such an easy and enjoyable read. And I love all the references for the family. So, and it's just not nutritious for your mind and your body, but it's also it's nutritious for your spirit. Yeah. That's you what know. it's all about, man. Where do yeah. people get the book? Anywhere books are sold, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, your favorite local bookstore, of course. But if you go to eatsmartercookbook.com, of course, you know how we do it. Just like you have this, and just for everybody listening, truly, like my first books being over there on that shelf is because of you. You know, you're a bridge. You didn't write the book, hmm. you know, I'll be it. But you, you, you are somebody who unites like superheroes, like nobody else. And you do it so effortlessly. And for all of us to understand, like you truly, man, you over deliver every single time. And I just appreciate that so much about you. And I strive to do the same thing. And so with this book, we've got some amazing bonuses. We put together a conference, a family health and fitness conference, where I'm bringing in these superheroes in their respective fields who have kids and families to share their strategies. Mm. How do they create a culture of wellness in their household? So you don't just hear it from me. I'm talking like, If we're looking in the realm of like fitness, we've got Gabby Reese, right? So icon, she actually, there was a time when her sports shoe with Nike outsold Jordan's. It was a small time, it was a few months. Mm -hmm. But you know, because her fame in in volleyball. And, uh, but she's really, really about that life, man. And just has created some amazing things. Uh, We've got uh, Dr. Will Bolsowitz, who's a specialist on gut health and award-winning gastroenterologist, same thing. How did he create a, 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 a culture of wellness in his own family and his unique perspective on gut health and you know supporting our kids' gut health? Because the microbiome is like having a moment right now, for example. But you get access to all these superstar experts as well for free with this summit. The ticket to the summit is $297. You get free wow. access virtually from anywhere. So we're making this truly, the reason that they're doing this and all the giveaways we have is that these different companies, these different individuals are on this mission too, to rekindle families, to unite families, to really be an advocate for family wellness, because that's how we're gonna drive into the future and really create a tipping point so we can normalize health again. I love it, I absolutely love it. Everyone go to the website. Do you wanna get the website again for the book? Eatsmartercookbook.com. Eatsmartercookbook.com. And I challenge everybody to take a screenshot of this episode, wherever you're consuming this, whether it's on YouTube or Spotify or, or what have you. 
tag Sean, tag myself. What what social media? At Sean Model, S-H-A-W-N-M-O-D-E-L. Yes, and post it. And then what do you want people to put in the post? Maybe we could ask them a question or something that they could, uh, so they'll post it, they'll tag you and I so we get to see it. Do you want to ask them a question to, to add to it? What is their favorite, what is their favorite meal? And I mean, is it breakfast, lunch, dinner, brunch, dessert? What is your, what is your favorite meal? I love it. All right, so that's the challenge. Everyone take a small, simple step and then go get the book. Again, it will not only nourish your, your mind and body, but it will nourish your, your, your spirit. We'll put all, all the links again in our show notes at jimquick.com forward slash notes. Sean, buddy, thank you. My man, I love you. Thank you. Me too.